Good morning and welcome to the Library of the Senate. May I first of all thank the Senate and President, the President of the Senate, represented by Senator Arrigoni. Thank them for their hospitality and uh, for the attention they focus on these issues. It is a great honor to be in such a prestigious uh, building. Thank you to the ministry, the minister of the environment, land and sea. Thank you for being here, minister. And thank you for what you've been doing for these issues and for being so present in the events we organize. You are the institutional, the symbolic presence, but uh, you are also You are also operationally present, and I would like to thank and welcome you all. This is the second preparatory event uh, towards uh, the first national conference of the system for environmental protection that will take place in February. We have chosen the title for today's meeting on purpose because it's so important for us. We have ISPRA and SNPA represented here. Parliament has backed me on this too. What we need is a capillary network that is truly able to meet the needs of the country and the citizens in an effective and timely manner. We have to hurry up. In fact, we should do today or even yesterday what we need to do. Everybody, in order to do this, must look beyond our own horizon. They must look towards the economic world, the business world, and the external reality that is asking us again and again to intervene in an authoritative and timely manner. We must thank the Club of Rome and congratulate them for their, on their anniversary. And the three guests will be speaking to us later about looking towards our future, but bearing in mind our past, the starting point. So welcome to Jürgen Rangas, Ernst von Witzecker, and Anders Wickman. Thank you for coming, and thank you for what you've done over the years. And thank you to all the friends here from the Club of Rome. We must not, while looking forward, we must not forget what's going on at the moment. The fires, for example, that uh, have been a problem for industrial plants, the last one just a few days ago in Lombardy, the problems of hydrogeological instability, the environmental damage that is uh, the result of all this. Uh, the air we breathe in our cities make us think and talk often about the smog emergency. These are just some of the environmental problems we have to tackle. We, as an environmental protection system, and therefore we have to look at the local but also national, European, and international dimension. We have tasks that are very urgent and well defined by the law. And all this is fundamental, but I think it is also absolutely essential to link all this to targeted research. We realize that the challenges lying before us are the reference point. But I see all this with optimism because I know the quality of the persons involved and the passion they put in their work every day. 
knowing, and I repeat this to the general directors present here, knowing that we will be able to uh, uh, tackle the challenges only if we do so as a system. Amongst the subjects we'll be tackling today are the subjects of uh, challenges for the future. But I would like to stress the word future and what it means for us, for we who deal with environmental protection. We know that we are highly responsible when it comes to building a sustainable future for the future generations. We need a decisive turning point, a new economic and social paradigm. As the books we'll be talking about later explain limits to growth and come on, because we cannot embark upon the path towards sustainability unless um, we deal with the environment. The SMP must work with the changes and the processes that are inevitable. And here, the green economy and circular economy come into it, too. So we need control, environmental protection, and dedicated in research, because this is what is going to guarantee that we will find authoritative and scientifically well-founded solutions. And to conclude, I would like to quote the results of the activities that we publicize through reporting, uh, press releases, dedicated events, uh, posts on the social media, data that are collated, validated, and certified because we need the authoritativeness of public bodies vis-a-vis -vis our citizens. We must have the courage to look forward, to be uh, long-sighted. We have to look at things that we can't even imagine now. We have to help uh, uh, guide all uh, the new evolutions so as to protect our citizens, <clears throat> be at the disposal of the various public institutions, but uh, we must, above all, become an example of best practices at the international level, national level, and of course within the European Union, so that we can achieve homogeneous levels of environmental protection throughout our territory. These are our strategies, our challenges, but also our strategies. And there's a term that I like to use, not because I want to give this an ecumenical vision, but because it's so important to be effective, and that is together. It is together that we must think of a, create a system that includes agencies, institutions, the economic world, business world, and last but not least, the citizens. We must not close ourselves uh, up into a uh, self-sufficient logic, which sometimes we tend to do. We must accept the challenges and work within a common or joint dimension. This is the target of our activity, and this is the path we want to embark upon. And we will hear from, the from those who have uh, experience uh, and contributions to describe those who have worked for years on these issues and still do. Thank you. Cedo la parola al Ministro dell'Ambiente. And I give the floor to the Minister of the Environment, Land and Sea. 
Thank you. Good morning. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here, also because it's an important day today. In Ferrara, we organized the first event and we talked about uh, enterprises, uh, environmental enterprises. Uh, we cannot protect the environment unless we work with the business world. That is to say, the economic protection of the environment. We, of course, today will be talking, well, daily we work with the scientific world and the independence of the scientific world is absolutely essential, of course, if we want to have future hope for the future. And then in December, we'll have the last event before the February one. So we have these three steps that are very interesting, and I thank La Porta and Bracchi for having defined this uh, process and organized the events. Now, scientific rigor. Today is the day to talk about these issues. Why? Because those who make political decisions and guide national decisions at national level, at European level, at world level, must be supported by uh, scientific analyses, uh, technical studies, and it is only the independence of all this work, this scientific work, that uh, will mean that the political work is healthy. Now, 10 days ago, I think it was, the last the IPCC report was published. Uh, 91 researchers at world level that are saying, watch it, there's a deadline. 2030 is the deadline, but the planet beyond a certain date will not survive as we know it. So it's not a politician who's saying this, who may say it for personal reasons or electoral reasons. No, 91 researchers, 90, I think it was 91, uh, about 90 researchers, including Italian researchers, are telling us, watch it, beware. Well, that attention on climate change shows us that there's something, something is changing. And here you have an analysis of the trends. Remember the day before yesterday at the Club of Rome? We heard this analysis and we realized that we must, there are decisions we have to take. After the blah blah come the decisions. But what decisions are we taking? Well, in Luxembourg, seven or eight days, two days after the report was published, we decided to cut CO2 emissions from the motor industry, from the traffic, and you know how important this is, to cut it by 35% by 2030, beyond the Paris Agreement, that is. I went there to get 40%. That was my target. But 25 out of 28 countries had gone there to get 25%. 25 countries wanted 25% out of 28 countries. Three wanted 40 Italy, France, and Sweden. And then after 16 hours, I told some friends this uh, a few days ago, after all those hours of negotiations, we went down by 5%, and they accepted. They went up to 35%. I see that as a conquest, as a victory. Thanks to the 91 researchers that wrote that report, it's thanks to them that we managed to achieve this victory. Because otherwise, this would never have been accepted by the politicians. 
Whereas when we had this substantial support, I brought the IPCC results and I said, look, these are the figures. This is an independent research work. Whether you like it or not, it's a fact, and we have to decide on the basis of facts. Politicians need this uh, fundamental basis. And then there's another thing we should ask ourselves. How should we intervene? Because how to intervene makes a difference, too. We have two levels, the national level and the international level. The national level has the national and the local level, whereas the international level has the European and the planetary level. Okay, so the national level on climate change intervenes in a rather to a rather modest extent. The European one a bit greater, and the planetary one intervenes in a significant manner. But there's not only this, there's also how we want to do this that will make the difference. What do I mean? One of the arguments, one of the subjects being discussed uh, politically uh, at supranational level is the relationship between the so-called developed countries, the G7, the environment of the environment, and the countries, the developing countries that are not in the G7 environment. The ones that make up the COP, COP, the, there'll be the Poland uh, COP soon. Why do I say this? Because the rigor of the scientific figure and the autonomy of this uh, allows us uh, to reflect in these fora to, so that we can say to the countries, uh, the developing countries, as compared to the developed countries that include Italy as well, how can we ensure the environmental protection of the planet, because there are various ways we can do this. Italy has decided, and it was the only country thanked at the United Nations in New York, and I insist on this, Italy has decided to change the capacity building paradigm assistance to developing countries, that is. It, Italy has decided, and I sign the decrees for this, the MO, the MOUs, has decided not to colonize developing countries uh, by saying, I give you the mission trading, the money, assistance, and I decide what you should do for you. I give you the money, I give you the assistance, but no, I shouldn't decide what you should do. The third step is a mistake. That's environmental colonization. No, Italy has decided, I'll give you the mission trading, I will give you the capacity building, and I create a partnership with you. I will sit beside you so that you, who know your situation and your conditions best, and with me, I want to help you, and you know how mission trading works. I have to give you aid, but only so long as you can show me what you need. This is a true partnership, and we're the only country in the world that does this, and we are teaching the world how to do this. There is a formal uh, definition of how to do this, because it's this partnership that makes the difference. Just to give you a concrete example, and then I'll conclude, because I'm taking up too much of your time, an example of how to match the concept of uh, 
growth and development. Growth is quantitative. We were saying this on our telephone. Development is qualitative. What do we want? Quantity or quality? Well, I think that with the partnership system, both come together and not only growth, but quality growth. And these are not just words. How can I prove this? I signed it's not, I will do, no, I have actually signed an MOU for the protection of Sahel. You know where Sahel is. It's that strip, it's 10 countries that are above Central Africa. Niger, Burundi, the part that is struck most by desertification and climate change and the total destruction of the territory's culture with the abandoning, well, an emigration, of course, exodus from the, the area. It's the part that suffers, suffers most in the entire world. So, economic commitment, mission trading, so we take cash there. Second element, capacity building. We take our experts, technical experts, and our companies, our enterprises, in this virtuous circle for our enterprises as well, because thanks to uh, technological evolution, have the best technological ideas and tools, two different things, about eco-compatible solutions like solar energy. But then we decide with the 10 countries about how and where we should invest to obtain what? To get a rewind of desertification. Let's start regaining land through the building of wells, uh, making citizens uh, stay where they are instead of like, moving all the time. They, that's what they asked us. It's not something I decided, so we are not colonizing. What they've said to us is we must stop migrating. We must be able to stay where we come from. We don't want to migrate anymore. We don't like emigrating. We are compulsory migrants. We don't want to, though. So help us to stop migrating. That's what they have asked us to help them do. And help us develop, but develop in a clean manner rather than becoming like the G7 countries that used polluting energy to grow. So help us grow and develop in a clean manner. This is the context that we should be working in, and that is why research must be independent so that politics can be clean. So you see the difference? They're, these are small signs. We're not going to change the fate of Africa all in a go. But we are creating diplomatic interest at international level. And just to remain in Africa, which is the most alarming area, because you can't save the whole world all at once. I mean, we can't save the world by saving Italy, but we all have to try to save bits in order to save the world. We will be the first country, Italy, the first country in the world in January to open up here in Rome the Center for the Environmental Protection of Africa. It'll be here in Rome. 
and the presidents and the PMs of the African countries will come here because they have recognized the partnership we have created, whereas other countries go to them as colonizers. So look at how things are changing. Thank you. Bene, noi eh, ovviamente grazie al signor Ministro, grazie al Presidente Stefano Laporta, grazie anche per tutta una serie di suggestioni e grazie anche perché anche come Ispra eh, nelle chiacchierate che ci siamo fatti, insomma la possibilità di stare dentro a questo importantissimo progetto per quelle che sono ovviamente le nostre conoscenze è una cosa per noi che ci gratifica, che ci piace, che ci vede assolutamente coinvolti. Abbiamo proprio siglato recentemente questo progetto internazionale con una serie di paesi in via di sviluppo per dare assistenza a questo progetto ICAT, ICAT credo che si chiami, e, e, ed è prodromico insomma, a sviluppare tutta una serie di attività che ci vedranno impegnati anche su altre versanti e anche su questo cercheremo di far squadra con i colleghi delle agenzie perché sappiamo che ci sono già progetti importanti a livello internazionale a questo riguardo. Bene, io eh, ringraziandovi eh, chiedo di, 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 di spostarvi perché così eh, eh, abbiamo questo cambio anche di cavalieri. Di nuovo e proseguiamo con... And we continue. Paolo Rigoni, thank you for having uh, given us the premises and this room. Prego, se vi volete accomodare, Gianfranco, chiamo Gianfranco Bologna, Jorgen Randers, Ernst Urich. So we call Gianfranco Bologna, Jorgen Randers, Ernst von Wiesacker and Anders Wickman. Eh, iniziamo i nostri, i nostri lavori. Intanto che, 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 che ci si accomoda, io... Sì, va benissimo, questa, questa diapositiva va benissimo. Yes, this slide is perfect. Well, it's not that we want to publicize books, but it's the last product of the Club of Rome. And it's, I think, a very interesting book. Gianfranco, come up here. First of all, I'd like to say, as the president did, that this is an event we wanted to organize uh, on the opportunity of this anniversary. And we had two days, very interesting days, organized by the Club of Rome and the foundation, r represented by Gianfranco Bologna. And we thank him for this opportunity, because often the technical work, those who produce figures and reports, well, they're important at, at a given date, on, a, on the day. But I think people should understand how important their work is to construct scenarios, to make forecasts, to try, with the help of sciences that are more and more important, to understand what the strategic choice could be and should be. We were hearing yesterday and the day before, people were saying, that, oh, we know the phenomena, we know them all too well, and uh, it's high time we act. And the title of the book is what I was explaining yesterday, because the words come on in English can mean a lot of things. It has, can have different meanings, but the ultimate meaning is Come on, let's move together. We're still in time to try to reverse this paradigm that has to do with the economic system, with strategic and political decisions. But as the minister was saying, the role of a technical system 
a technical system that works well, that produces data, that carries out research, and that supplies the politician with the necessary tools for his job is absolutely essential. I would start immediately. We're a bit behind time already. I'd like to thank our guests and follow the program as I've received it. So thank you to the Club of Rome, the the Fundazione Aurelio Pace, the WWF, and I give the floor to Gianfranco Bologna, who works for the World Wildlife Fund, and I will present the others one by one as they take the floor and introduce them to you a little so you realize who you have before you. And I, once again, thank you very much for being here. Gianfranco, I thank you for, for ISPRA and I thank uh, the minister who made a wonderful presentation, well, which he summarized this morning, at the Club of Rome's 50th anniversary celebration. But we thank him also for his uh, focus on these issues. I will be very frank and tell you that I will try to be as brief as possible because it's much more interesting to hear from the wonderful figures we have, uh, gentlemen, we have here with us this morning. I'd just like to give you a brief introduction through some slides to link the vision that the Club of Rome has always had right from the beginning with this scientific dimension. Now, you should realize, and maybe you know this better than I do, that scientific knowledge and know-how is no longer only, is not seen only as uh, uh, the rule. Well, we're getting to know the world more and more. Sustainability science, or the science on sustainability, which is what the Club of Rome is trying to give content to, tells us that it's based on the science of complexity. Sustainability is based on complexity. And I think this had been understood very well by our extraordinary master, who was Bache and the foundation that represents his thought is called uh, as it is. He was a visionary. And we must thank this wonderful Italian thinker who in 1968, just think of that year, he thought up a, a, a think tank to think over what the future of humanity could be. He brought together people with incredibly different backgrounds to think about and talk about these things because they shared their concern for the future. And the limits to growth is the result of this. This, well, there was one volume and then there were two further volumes uh, with uh, the, uh, his collaborators that are mentioned here. He was one of the authors also of the 2052 scenario and of the last report that you'll hear more about later. You see Jorgen up there, the one who's speaking is Dennis Middles. You have Aurelio Bicce on Dennis's right, and then you have Jorgen as a young man. This is the presentation of Limits to Growth in 1972 in March at the Smithsonian Institute. So just think, and I come to this link now because the details of limits to growth you will hear about from Jorgen, who was a participant. Uh, here you have uh, 
Well, what I wanted to stress with this slide is that when the Club of Rome started working on limits to growth in 1972, at the beginning of March, there was no satellite, no satellite that uh, examined our planet to try to understand what the mutational changes were and what was coming about. In July 1972, you'll remember, those of you who are as old as I am, that the first Landsat 1 of NASA was launched. That was the first one dedicated to this, because there were others. There were others, but they were more military in nature. So this was the first one that was actually dedicated to finding out what the state of the planet was. And we have these extraordinary men who came up with limits to growth without having all the data that we can base ourselves on now. And they came up with global change and the Earth system sciences. The Club of Rome is not a scientific body. It is a body that brings together many people whose wish it is to try to understand how to tackle the major problems we ourselves have created, and it includes many competencies. But as I was saying before, it's well, it gives a scientific basis. But what do we mean when we talk about sustainability of uh, uh, growth? There is no recipe as such. It's a question of adapting to situations that we find before us. But it says, watch it. There is a guardrail here. So this was the beginning of when thinking these issues began. Willis Stefan is here, one of the major authors of these, uh, this research. And you see, they started to think about global change, about the Earth system. The Earth seen as a, an entire system. And one of the members of the Club of Rome until 1983, when he passed away, was Buzzani Traverso, a very big Italian researcher who was an advisor of the UN and who had already thought up a research program for the planet. And in the Club of Rome, he called it Scheming Our Changing Planet. And then it became the International uh, Sphere and Biosphere Program. So, and then you had all the reflection on these issues with a scientific basis. And here you have the main protagonists, uh, Paul Crutzen, the Nobel Prize. And uh, when he started stressing the fact that maybe the world was in a new geological era, he was trying to explain what was going on as opposed to the natural evolution of the world. We asked him to come and give us a lecture, and it was a wonderful lecture. This work now has led to a planetary program of research that is this, Future Earth. I'm sure many of you are very well acquainted with this. It's one of the most extraordinary instruments that brings together scientific know-how and knowledge from all over. And this year, 2018, the two major insti research institutions, the Council for Science and the International Social Science Council, got together. And this just goes 
to show, and I'm speaking to our minister, that social sciences and natural sciences, and the Club of Rome here was a real protagonist, because they always tried to bring together even the initial reports on microelectronic uh, evolution. <coughs> were written by the Club of Rome to point out how the economy does not take into account the value of nature. It was the Club of Rome that wrote these. In 1995, we were in Brussels, and we presented a wonderful report called Taking Nature into Account, written by Boundir and as coordinator, but he was one of the, but there was Herman Daly as author as well. So just to show you how the Club of Rome has always tried to bring together social sciences and natural sciences to move towards this innovative approach. And uh, limits to growth, then the planetary boundaries, John Rockstrom, and and I would like to thank Anders Wixman who, for the work done in this field. And he is more and more linked to the Club of Rome. On the 17th, there was a presentation by him. He was on his way to Washington, but he stopped off. And uh, thank you to Jorgen Randers for his very last report. A wonderful, wonderful one immediately after come on. And he has identified with other researchers, Willie Stephan and others, the planetary boundaries. And another member, Kenneth Farrett, brought together the planetary boundaries that sort of, which is the definition of the SOS here. I think the future words are SOS and donut. The opera safe operating space, which is where humanity must live. Because this is the message. What do we mean by sustainable development? In a nutshell, it means to live within the limits of the planet Earth. But this does not, we don't want to talk only about danger, but also about opportunity. So the SOS must be, in the SOS, we must put content, which is all the innovations, etc. And this is a, includes all the elements below which we cannot go to maintain our dignity. The, dignity uh, of uh, whatever human being. Here's the worrying situation. Those who've read the last works by on this uh, by the National Academy of Sciences, you'll see in, in what conditions we are living. But we're still in time to do something about this, and I quickly conclude. We're still in time if, if, we see to it, <coughs> make sure that wherever we are, when people ask us, how can we put into practice this SOS that is a danger and an opportunity? How do we put it into practice? Well, right from the uh, local council, the uh, regional council, the uh, big businesses, national government. We would like all these levels to be working on this kind of program. The details of the planetary boundaries are so interesting, and it shows how we can adapt this model even to a district, a local city district. I don't know, there may be a waste problem which is, well, waste is a quarter boundary, a district boundary, and work out how to manage the social uh, dimension. And here, two last reports, the authors here, 
we have the two authors, the second Wickman, who've come up, uh, who came up with uh, Factor 4 and Factor 5 to show how you can dematerialize our economy and come up with energy and economic flows that are lower than the present and that stay within the planetary boundaries. So here you have what I'm sure Jorgen will speak to you about. These are the prospects that you find in the last report presented on the 17th that Jorgen will be talking about. And the choice, the choice of what to do so that uh, the safe operating space. Uh, I uh, love uh, uh, cake. Uh, 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 every morning that is in that shape. And I always, when I have that for my breakfast, I think of these issues. Thank you. This was a very interesting report, and then we will uh, discuss some of the issues you've raised during your presentation. I would now like uh, to ask Jorgen and Aram, this was uh, often been mentioned in his presentation, to take the floor. Would, would you like to go to... Would, okay. okay, you can take the floor. This is the, I think it works, I hope so. Ok, eh, eh, è stato presentato molto sinteticamente da, da, da Gianfranco. Eh. If I were to introduce you uh, to uh, this uh, speaker, I think it would take me like 20 minutes to read out all the things he's done so far. Uh, he has been a co-author of the well-known book, Limits to Growth. The translation into Italian is Limiti allo sviluppo, Limits to Growth, or Limits to Development, actually, in Italian, Sviluppo, Development. And uh, uh, every time I think about development, I always think about uh, uh, the, uh, the development of a um, butterfly from caterpillar to uh, uh, butterfly, all the various stages that the butterfly goes through. And that's what I think of uh, when I think about development. Uh, so as a biologist, uh, I couldn't understand why uh, it was actually translated with uh, the word development rather than growth. Uh, Okay, you need, I, I think you need, I know, but I am sorry, because you need, well, I, I, I just, uh, I was just talking about the difference between growth and development. And the, the book, the original book was Limit to Growth, and was, uh, the translation in Italy was uh, uh, Limits to Development. Really? Yes, more or less. It, 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 was, uh, it was in this way. But uh, uh, in questo li in the new the, in the new way this is uh, is uh, uh, growth so it's correct <laughs> anyway uh, um, I give you uh, the floor please uh, Jorgen Randers uh, uh, we will uh, uh, listen uh, very carefully your presentation thank you very much for being here fine okay uh, good morning. Uh, I will be speaking to you about the report which is called Transformation is Feasible and which was launched two days ago during the 50 year uh, anniversary uh, of the Club of Rome. Uh, the reason why I will talk about this uh, report here is that it is a wonderful example of the importance of your work, the data collection work. The study that we have made could not be made unless there was all the data, the time series data 
available uh, on which we base our conclusions and our analysis. And so I want initially to, to tell you, uh, you know, to keep up the good work. You know, for the people like I, this is absolutely essential. And what you will see at the end of my presentation is some guideline as to where you ought to focus your statistical attention, you know, in the years to come in order to be upfront, you know, basically measuring those things that will be of political importance in the years ahead. So that's the general idea. I'll go through uh, the analysis relatively quickly, uh, but what you should think about afterwards is, you know, how can this be applied in your strategic planning? So, this new report to the Global Rome is called Transformation is Feasible. Originally, the thing was called Transformation is Necessary. You know, it's a call for transformation. But we thought that it is important not to be negative. You know, it's rather to say that it is both necessary and it is possible. So, that's the political message, main message uh, of the book. It started by asking these questions. So the scientific question we ask is, if global society continues to behave the way they have typically behaved, how many of the 17 UN development goals will be achieved by 2030? And since the sad conclusion is that very few will be satisfied by 2030. We also ask the question, how many will be achieved by 2050? Of course, in order to answer that question, one has to make assumptions about how society is going to react to the challenge. So this is a deep analysis, basically, of how individuals, corporations, nations, cities, the world will respond when conditions evolve over the next 30 years. You know, what decisions will be made, what decisions will be postponed. In order to make meaningful assumptions about how society will react to the emerging problems, we use statistics, and that's where you come in. You know, we extract from a huge database about how decisions were made during the last 30 to 40 years, parameters, so that we can then make a science-based, empirically-based assumption about what will happen over the next uh, 30 years. So this is the method being used. The important thing which also relates to ISPRA is the second question, because it is not only a question of whether we will achieve or not achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. The question is what will be the resulting pressure on the planet? You know, is this doable uh, within the limits that Gianfranco spoke about? So the second question is, you know, what, what will be the pressures on the environment, you know, nine dimensions of the environment uh, over the next uh, 2030 and to 2050? And then the third question is, of course, there, since the picture that comes out is relatively negative, uh, the question is, what could be done? You know, is there anything which is technically doable and politically doable, you know, to accelerate the human response to the coming uh, crisis. So that's the logic of, of, the, uh, of the report. To do the work, and this is deliberately made so you cannot read it, it just signals these are hundreds of thousands of data points put together in three 
models, one model that generates future scenarios, one model that looks at the social side, socioeconomic side, another one which looks at the, the environmental side, and then there are the performance indicators that try to figure out to what extent will sustainable development goals be achieved, what will be the pressure on the, on the planetary boundary, and most important, in the down right-hand corner, is the well-being index. So we try to accumulate all of this into what will be the subjective well feeling or well-being for the majority of the people. We are excluding the elite. We are looking at what will the 80% of the population actually feel and think uh, going through. I will not speak about that latter point uh, because of uh, lack of time. But that's an interesting thing you should have a look at, you know, uh, in the whole study. By the way, the study is available from the Club of Rome website, and the technical uh, stuff is available on Archive X, which is a pre-publication website. So all of this is available in the public domain without cost. So the, the first uh, question is then, um, You know, how many of the sustainable development goals will be achieved? So what we have done, we have developed one indicator for each of the goals, and then we have tried, we have collected statistics. So the top one is the one on, uh, on uh, the fraction of population which is poor. And you see how the extent of poverty is coming down to the 2018 point, and then it is our forecast for what will happen to poverty going to the right in the graph at the top. And this has been done for all the 17 sustainable development goals. We have chosen one indicator, you know, how long you live, uh, how many years you go to school, how many children you get, uh, maternal health, etc., etc. And for all of them, we have then regionalized the world into seven regions, and we then calculate you know, how many are poor, how many uh, healthy, how, how long do you live, etc., etc. One indicator for each of the 17 sustainable development goals. It gets very messy, and these are again very deliberately small ones, so you don't get stuck in the detail. So we do this, you know, for, for, for all the 17 goals. And it's interesting, as you see, in some of the cases, you know, the world moves from red territory into yellow territory into green territory, meaning that the sustainable development goal gets, you know, accepted, uh, achieved over time. In other cases, it moves the other way around, that like in global warming, you know, the temperature is going to continue rising for the next 30 years, meaning that the arrow goes further and further into the red territory. The only way to try to understand what's going on is to try to sum it up. So here is a graph that shows how many sustainable development goals will be satisfied uh, as a function of time from 1980 to 2050 to the right. And if you look at the blue line at the top, this is for the United States of America, where you see that gradually, you know, initially they had satisfied roughly 14 out of the 17 sustainable development goals. And over time, that number is actually going down. So in the United States, it's going in the wrong direction. The reason is, of course, that environmental conditions are going to not be better, but get worse over time. And since the social goals are largely uh, satisfied in the United States, uh, it is going down for the environmental reasons and because of inequity. You know, the United States society is moving gradually in a direction where the elite takes more and more of the income and the, and the wealth, and as a consequence, the equity, uh, so sustainable development goal, uh, just, you know, gets less and less. You look at the green line, that's Europe, uh, which essentially follows the same 
pattern as the United States. And then you can see for the red line is China. And you see China moving from not having achieved very many of the sustainable development goals up to um, roughly 2000. You know, during the last 18 years, China has moved tremendously in the direction of satisfying more and more and will continue to do so over the next uh, uh, 30 years and so on. And you see in this case Africa is the lagging nation that's where fewest of the sustainable development goals will be satisfied over time according to our analysis, you know, doing uh, what uh, I said. To make it even simpler, we then try to summarize at the global level, so this is the blue line here. So, assuming business as usual, meaning that people and institutions and nations do respond in the conventional manner to, to new uh, situations, we will uh, move in the positive direction over time. You know, we have been at the level of having satisfied nine out of the 17 sustainable development goals. In 2030, the number will be, uh, what does it say, 10 and a half. You know, so we will be better, but we will, of course, be very far away from the 17 uh, sustainable development goals, which would be, uh, which is the UN ambition. And even if we go out to 2050, so we allow much more time to, to work on these things, our forecast is that unless we change very dramatically the policies and the actions of the nations of the world, we will not get very far. We will only get to like 12 out of these things. And at the end of the period, you see the blue line starting to decline, which is basically that the planetary boundaries are exceeded so that you're starting to move backwards. Then to the pressure. So I know I've spoken about the extent to which you know society, the global society, will achieve the goals. But then the cost of doing so is pressure on the nine planetary boundaries that Johan Rockström invented ten years ago and Gianfranco uh, mentioned. And so we do exactly the same thing for each of the nine planetary boundaries. And you can look at the top graph, which is the planetary boundary number one, which is global warming, where society has decided that we should try to keep below one plus one and a half degrees centigrade, which is the place of the, the yellow band in the, in the curve. And you see the temperature according to our uh, modeling will continue to increase all the way to 2050, meaning that we will move in the wrong direction. You know, basically the pressure on the planet uh, in that dimension will increase. But when you look at the one to the right, you see the ozone depletion. You know, the, the ozone hole and the the, clear, the 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 pollutants that actually destroy the ozone hole are going to decline. So there we will move from red territory via yellow territory into green. Ocean acidification, which is the third one, how acidic is the ocean going to get? It will get gradually more acidic, but not very much. Look at forest degradation. The forests are going to be continue to be cut, you know, although we will uh, do something to try to limit the cut. The actions will not be strong enough to avoid further degradation, etc., etc. So you see nutrient overloading, you see freshwater overuse moving from currently green to orange and then close to the red over the next 50 years. Biodiversity loss, biodiversity, you know, continuing downwards. Air pollution, that's a positive one where we predict that the bad air pollution in China is going to disappear very quickly and in that way actually improve the well-being of Chinese people uh, also very quickly. Again, it gets very messy because there are so many graphs, uh, so we try to aggregate and we try to aggregate into what we call the safety margin. So that basically means 
how many of the nine planetary boundaries are we below, you know? So, so if that index is at nine, it means that we have not pushed over the limit for the nine. Uh, in reality, uh, even in 1980, you know, we had overshot one limit, uh, and since then we have overshot, you know, four or five more. The blue line is coming down. When the blue line is all the way down to zero, it means that we have no more safety margin, then we are up at the limit for all of those nine dimensions. And you see, our forecast is basically that at this, while we are, at, so at the same time as we are not satisfying that uh, sustainable development goals, the pressure that we put on the planet is going to increase so that the safety margin just continues down. There is no total collapse here, you know, things are just getting less and less nice. It's, it's just that the, it's not that the world absolutely disappears. So then, so that's the sad story. You know, we're basically saying that if we continue to behave the way we have behaved before, this is we're not going to satisfy the, uh, the sustainable development goals, and we are going to in, uh, increase the environmental burden, you know, the, the pressure on the planet. So the question then is, of course, what could be done? And we have then done three uh, experiments in uh, the, the report. The first one is to say that, to respond to the politicians and to people who say that, you know, what is necessary in order to solve the problem is more money. If we could just get more money, then we could solve all the uh, sustainable development goals. And so we have made a scenario where we say, okay, let's assume that the world actually pulls itself together so that they manage to increase the economic growth rate by 1% per year, so that the GDP, instead of growing at 2.5% two, two per year, grows at 3.5% per year. And then assume that that's all you do, and then assume that we uh, use that money to try to accelerate uh, the sustainable development goals in the normal manner. And the sad fact is that, uh, let's see, now I need to go back, I presume. Uh, no, this is good. So, um, so you see to the left again is the same curve which shows how many goals are being satisfied going forwards. The blue line is business as usual. Uh, the red line is what happens if we spend a lot of more money on, 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 on doing this. And you see it does improve the situation a little bit in the short term. You know, but it doesn't really matter a lot in the long term because, of course, when you increase the economic activity on the planet, you press harder on the boundaries so that the, you satisfy the social system, sustainable development goals, but you violate the environmental sustainable development goals. Then the yellow line is the second experiment, and that's where you say that, okay, so we will not increase the economic growth rate, but let's rather be more intelligent in the way we try to pursue each of the 17 sustainable development goals. And you see that works also somewhat in the short term and perhaps also in the long term, but it doesn't really change the picture dramatically. So that's the main conclusion from the policy analysis in this case, that it doesn't really help to accelerate the economic growth rate to solve the problem, because when you do that, you will just make as much harm as you did before, and it doesn't help very much to be particularly elegant in your implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, because it, it helps, but it doesn't solve the whole problem. So then comes, of course, the question, is there anything you can do, you know, in order to, to follow the green line, you know, where you actually satisfy all the sustainable development goals by 2050, and where you also try to restore the capacity of the earth, so that you move back, you know, away from the brink and towards the, the uh, thicker uh, 
uh, safety level. And uh, we have pondered this both in this study and in many other earlier studies, and we have ended up with saying that there are four things that could be done. And those four things, if implemented, would actually solve the problem. We are, of course, totally aware of the fact that these things are not politically possible. So this, in many ways, is unlikely to happen. But this is what is necessary uh, and is uh, technically doable. Uh, so the first thing is to stop using coal, oil, and gas as quickly as possible, phasing it out from current use to zero in 2050. You must remember that 70% of all the greenhouse gases come from the burning of coal, oil, and gas. So if we just stop using coal, oil, and gas for producing of electricity, for driving the car, and for heating in industry and homes, do that in a 20-year period, that's our recommendation number one. The second uh, recommendation is to move the agricultural system of the world from its current rather unsustainable ways to more sustainable ways. This is important because agriculture is perhaps of the order of 20% of all greenhouse gas emissions. So if you both cut coal, oil, and gas, and you modernize agriculture, you know, that solves the problem. Then the third thing is perhaps the most uh, rebellious conclusion. So we are now 40 to 50 years into the move to try to get rid of poverty in the world. You know, everyone has tried, India has tried, Africa has tried, the Chinese have tried, everyone has tried. The only ones that have managed to do anything significant are the Chinese. And so our view is em empirically based. Those guys managed to remove s move roughly 700 million people out of poverty in 40 years. And we're still arguing that one should follow the Washington consensus and try to e establish liberal market economies in the third world and that that is the best way to solve the problem. We say that empirical data tells us that the conventional way does not work. We have a case where someone has managed to do this. Why don't they, you guys follow that model instead of the Western model? The fourth one is totally obvious, redistribute income. The interesting thing is that the total cost of implementing all the sustainable development goals in a centralist command economy is of the order of 1 to 2 percent of the GDP. So it's to 1 to 2 percent of the total income of the world. So you just add, you, you ask the 10 percent richest people of the world to pay those 1 to 2 percent in extra tax, and then you use that money to solve all the problems. That's totally trivial. No problem, there will be a political majority for taxing the 10% richest because 90% are not rich, so this is even doable in a democracy. This is, of course, what the Chinese are doing already. You know, but, uh, and then, finally, the fifth one, it is very important to continue the dramatic decline in fertility in the number of children per woman, particularly in the rich world, because each rich person has a much heavier footprint than a poor person in, in India, but you need to do the same thing also in India. So these are the wonderful practical advice from, uh, from us. Uh, this ought to be done, and if this was done, you know, we would end up in the top left-hand corner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you say goodbye to the minister. We go on to the second speaker. Of course, my introduction should be very lengthy here, but... Uh, 
Ernst von Weizsäcker, I hope I've pronounced it correctly, is the author of three extremely important reports of the Club of Rome. And uh, he is above all co-author of the book we've been speaking about, the last production of the Club of Rome, which is Come On. He has also experience with the Bundestag, so he has political experience too, as well as scientific experience. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Challenges in the full world. The Club of Rome highly appreciates, as Jürgen has said, the core work of your uh, various regional and central organizations. Data collection is very important and you also talk about the remedies. But our own focus in Kamamtsi, at least, is somewhere else. Well, let me start with that shock which Herman Daly, former chief economist at the World Bank, uh, formulated the difference between the empty world and the full world. From the empty world, 100 years ago or so, all our instincts originated, I mean, that's millions of years ago, all religions, all languages, the European Enlightenment, the economy of mining, just taking out of the environment what is there, uh, population increase, and the adoration of growth. But is that fit for the full world? I'm afraid it's not. Most of it has to be fundamentally changed. So, just one example. Uh, if you want more fish in the empty world, what do you do? More fishermen, more nets, more boats, and you have more fish. As simple as that. But today in the full world, the most important thing for having more fish is marine protection zones against fishing. It's the opposite of what used to be in the, in the empty world. Then the Anthropocene has been mentioned uh, by Giancarlo uh, um, Franco. This is a new phenomenon. When I was a child, we were still living in the empty world. And it jumped upwards since 1950. A dramatic change. People don't know. Historians don't describe this. This is the Anthropocene. It's not only the scare of fullness. Climate change can be a lot scarier. I mean, this is from an Italian school book. The difference between a cool world and a hot world is dramatic for the city of Rome or for the Po uh, area, etc. We really have to do something about it. I mean, uh, Anders is going to talk about it. Now, we were very happy with the Paris Agreement, but how is it handled in the capitals of the world? You know, the climate diplomats come back to the um, uh, capitals and say, we have to do something more about climate. And then the uh, politicians typically say, yes, yes, let's do a little more. But it's going to be very, very expensive. So we need a lot more growth. Is that the right answer? Well, look, there are eight economic sectors plotted, and in each one of them, there is a strict correlation between economic turnover and carbon dioxide emissions. So, we seem to be reasonably good doctors regarding the diagnosis of the problem, it's climate. But we are unbelievably bad therapy doctors. Our therapy makes the disease worse systematically. So we seem to be in a deep philosophical crisis. Well, the trouble is, people seem to have a strong preference for reassuring lies over inconvenient truth. A couple of weeks after Al Gore had his wonderful book and film, An Inconvenient Truth. I was living in California at the time. Uh, this cartoon appeared. You know, people go to a cinema where you have a convenient lie. 
Okay, that's the problem. Well, come on goes then therefore a little deeper into the analysis. Thank you, uh, Gianfranco, for launching the whole thing in Italian. It's three parts. Come on, don't tell me the current trains are sustainable. Come on, don't stick to outdated philosophies. And then, come on, join us on an exciting journey towards a sustainable world. I fully agree with what uh, Jürgen has said, and Anders is going to expand on it a bit. Well, I believe it's a flagship report for its 50th anniversary. Population increase, as has been said, is at the core of the full world problems. Now, we took a great encouragement from Pope Francis' encyclical Laudato Si, saying, greed, selfishness, brutal competition, purely utilitarian economics destroy our common home. And then we notice that the heroes of modern economics are systematically misinterpreted and misquoted and abused to legitimate this destructive growth. For instance, for Adam Smith, it was clear that the geographical reach of the markets was identical with the reach of the law and of morale. But today, markets are global and the law remain uh, national. So, a very difficult time for making laws. And for David Ricardo, capital was not moving across borders. But today, I mean, he was the hero of free trade. Um, today, capital is the most mobile factor, swirling around the world almost, almost at the speed of light. It's a disaster for social equity, for the environment, for future generations. And for Charles Darwin, competition was mostly a local affair. For him, geographical borders were helpful for evolution. Now, the Anglo-Saxon philosophy mostly means reductionist philosophy. It is good as dissect at dissecting, but cannot say much about life, the future, and complex systems. What does anatomy tell you about ecosystems? Hardly anything. This is at the core of the philosophical crisis. It's all analytic and never looking into what has to be done. Responding to the philosophical crisis, we suggest to engage in a new enlightenment for the full world. For instance, balance could become a key notion for the new enlightenment between humans and nature, heart and brain, <coughs> short term and long term, public and private, religion and state, feminine and masculine, equity and rewards for achievement, both is necessary. Speed and stability, innovation and reliability. For all that we need, balance, not doctrines. I mean, <laughs> if you go to business schools, you always see that uh, kind of picture. The speediest will always win, but that's a catastrophe for civilization. Well, Western thinking tends to lean to dogmatism, Asian thinking, usually celebrates balance. So we have to learn from Asia and from Africa as well. Well, one piece out of this part three of Come On is increase efficiency. Thank you for mentioning the books. Factor four was also translated into Italian, um, which certainly were good approaches with Amory Lovins and later Charlie Hargroves, etc. But then there is the so-called rebound effect, or Jevons paradox. Efficiency tends to be eaten up by added consumption. I'm not going deeper into it. And fighting that rebound effect will require us to make the use of nature more expensive. When I was in the China Council advising the Chinese government, I said, let energy, water, minerals become more expensive each year in proportion to the documented average efficiency increases. It's a ping pong kind of thing. Because if prices go up, you will be forced to increase efficiency. 
as we did between labor productivity and wages, which is the basis of our prosperity today. The resource ping pong could cause a steady increase, perhaps fivefold uh, in 40 years, perhaps tenfold in 100 years, and that would greatly help overcome much of the conflict of society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, grazie davvero. Grazie davvero per queste suggestioni. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This book, uh, come on, has three ch chapters, let's say. The second one is a more, well, maybe I like to call it more philosophical, more strategic, the second chapter that talks about the paradigms of our economic model and tries to reason through it. And then the third part talks about situations that are possible, practical, that could be achieved in a philosophical context, however, that has to be different, uh, quite different from the last centuries. And now I give the floor to the last uh, speaker, to another co-author of the book, Anders Wickman. I have the pleasure of knowing him. He has a strongly political imprint as well. Is a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and I think his contribution will be extremely important to us. You have the floor, sir. And you have been very patient, I must say, <laughs> listening to all these speak. So I'll I'll try to be very brief. But um, let me add some comments, more specifically, to some of the particular issues sector issues I would, and sector challenges I would submit that are part of the necessary transformation uh, that both Ernst and Jürgen touched upon. And I underline what we really need is transformation. And you can most easily see it when you look at climate change and climate change mitigation. We have been quite proud, I think, in Europe we have had a climate policy over the last 15, 20 years. I was a member of the European Parliament for some time, so I worked on those dossiers. And we were so proud when we adopted the 2020-20 package in 2008, a year before the Copenhagen conference. And those 20% will be achieved, a reduction of our physical or territorial emissions in Europe over this period of time, ending in 2020. But it has been happening with incremental steps. And the only sector where we can realistically say that we have started transformation is electricity production, where we have increasing share of renewable energy in particular. And in combination with efficiency, that has led to a gradual decrease of fossil fuels. Still a large share, but uh, nevertheless. But in all other sectors, very little has happened. And now the task is to be zero in 2050. And if you read the most recent IPCC report, the message is very, very blunt. The world has to cut emissions by 50% from today till 2030. And if you compare those ambitions with the so-called INDCs, the uh, pledges that the members of the United Nations gave in Paris, and some of them have updated, it's a far cry from 50% reduction. In fact, there is no reduction at all to 20, 2030 in most of the INDCs. So we really need transformation. In the conference we had at, uh, at the Club of Rome, the 50th anniversary, one of the decisions was to adopt what we call a climate emergency action plan. 
And why emergency action? Well, if you read the IPCC report, it clearly states we are facing an existential threat. If we don't reduce emissions so we can sort of avoid crossing over the two degrees and hopefully not more than 1.5 degrees, there may be tipping points out there which would make the situation very, very difficult. I would say dramatic. Because some of those tipping points or so-called feedbacks on the planet would start to live their own life. And even if we then reduced emissions, it would be very, very difficult to come back to normal. So uh, uh, we need uh, some kind of an emergency plan. And we have identified some 10 very distinct actions which should be part of that for all over the world. And both Jürgen and Ernst have alluded to it. First one is ban fossil fuel exploration, new exploration from 2020. My wife is Norwegian, Jürgen is Norwegian. It's not a message that the Norwegian government would like. Secondly, we should, as Jürgen said, phase out fossil fuel use no later than 2050. Thirdly, we need to phase out the subsidies supporting fossil fuels and redirect those subsidies in support of low-carbon technologies. Fourthly, and this is very important, and it goes to what the minister was saying, I mean, much of the future will be decided in developing countries. And for development to happen, people have to have access to modern energy carriers. And today's modern energy carriers in most low-income countries are coal, oil and gas. And if we don't put in place renewable technology very, very quickly, they will be stuck in the coal-based economy. So we say triple investments in renewables as soon as possible. Today, investments are in the range of $300 billion we would say we need $1 trillion, no later than 2025, and we would have to earmark a lot of that to happen in low-income countries. And that's a big, big challenge, because investors look upon those countries as very risky. So what can we then do, as Italy, as the European Union, as Sweden, as Norway, to help de-risk those investments? The technologies are there, and they are developing nicely, Costs are coming down, storage is improving, but still investments don't happen. If you look into the statistics, and you are experts on data, most of the renewable investments in the so-called developing world take place in China. More than two-thirds. The next country in order is Brazil, and the third one is India. But if you look in most African countries, very limited investments. So this is a really, really big thing. And that's why I think it's very good that, that Italy is now focusing on, on some African countries. But, ladies and gentlemen, the challenge is not only energy. Materials, steel, cement, plastics, aluminium, I would add textiles, is around 25% of carbon emissions. And demand for infrastructure is growing as we speak. In the International Resource Panel that Ernst was chairing for many years, and I'm now a member, we have a meeting in Yokohama next week, uh, we have calculated that the need for in urban infrastructure is so, such, so big that it will double in the next 25 years in the world. So we'll build as much urban infrastructure as we have built hitherto. And as an example, China used as much cement between 2012 2010 and 2013, as the United States of America did during the 20th century. So the emerging economies are needing a lot of, of these kind of materials. But, but if it happens, if it happens with today's materials and technologies, only those emissions will eat up the carbon budget. So here a lot has to happen. And here I believe we need to take on a leadership role in the European Union. We talk a lot about the circular economy, and that's part of the answer. We need innovation also to, to do materials differently. For instance, in Sweden, we are now 
we have put a project in motion where the, the idea is to, to leave behind the traditional smokestacks and using coke and coal for, for the reduction of the oxygen in the ore, moving towards hydrogen. It will take time, but it's a step in, direct, in the right direction. Something similar has to happen with cement, with aluminium, with plastics and textiles. Uh, so there innovation is needed, but the circular economy would of course lead to a lot of benefits. We are literally throwing away a lot of money every year because very, very, very small percentage of the materials that we put on the market in different products have a life after first use cycle. We did a study in Sweden and we looked at steel, cement, aluminium, plastics and paper. And even for aluminium, where you hear the aluminium industry say, look, we have these closed loops. Well, two-thirds of aluminium is not in a closed loop. Beer cans, Coca-Cola cans, they, 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 they move in a closed loop. But in most other instances, aluminium is used in composite materials, and it's very, very difficult to recycle and reuse. So we need a revolution in design. Products that are put on the market should be easy, the materials that, that are part of them should be easy to reuse and recycle. And that is not happening. I don't know how many conferences I've been in, in Brussels discussing this, but we are not moving because we need these policy frameworks. And I can tell you, because I was chairing the Recycling Industry Association in Sweden for many years, I know firsthand that the secondary materials market is not really working for most materials because it's still less expensive to use virgin materials. And there are also quality aspects. So here a revolution has to happen and the European Union must take a lead role. And if the Commission is not taking the lead role, and I don't think it will during Mr. Juncker, we, the Member States, have to take a lead role. Finland, Sweden, Italy, the Netherlands, these countries have shown a keen interest. Let's join hands and do something about it. And here, we be, I believe, also we need a lot of research into new business models, and we look, have to look at the supply chain, how, how we can include all the different actors, because it's a rather complex thing, and materials are sourced from all over the world. So, so we, 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 we need new methodologies, we, new, we, we need research. Another area which I believe is very, very important is, as both Jürgen and Ernst alluded to, land use. Agriculture, forestry, and also degraded land, how we can regenerate uh, degraded land. One of the chapters in our book is about regenerative development. And we can do a lot to bring back life to soils and degraded land. Hans Herren, who is the chairman or the CEO of the Millennium Institute and a very renowned uh, uh, agriculturalist, he said yesterday, the invention of the plow was one of the dumbest inventions mankind ever did. Because every, th every time we put a plow in the soil, we release a lot of carbon and we make erosion much more easy. So we need to develop new methodologies for agriculture no tilling, rotation of crops, perennial crops, build uh, roots in the soil, start build carbon in the soil. But we need carb uh, carbon accounting methodologies. How do you, how do you uh, guarantee permanence? And when you go to forests and the bioeconomy, here again, carbon accounting is lacking. It's very difficult to tell people what are the climate impact of substitution using biomass instead or, 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 or yeah, plants or biomass instead of fossil fuels. It's relatively easy when you use wood for a construction. But when you, have, when you start <coughs> replacing uh, viscose for, for polyester or you have green chemistry or you have biofuels, the methodologies are not really there. And the carbon accounting in forest ecosystems still leaves uh, a lot to be desired. So I've given you here a few areas where I think we need better policies, but we also need the help of science and data. 
So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think I stopped there in the interest of time. Um, I, 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 could, I could go on for, for, for quite a long time. Maybe just a comment about the bioeconomy. One of our members in the Club of Rome is Katja Bastioli uh, at Novamont. By the way, they are inaugurating a, a new plant bioeconomic refinery today. I think she has, she has some very useful uh, views to be shared widely. Um, and I think what, what they're trying to do uh, in terms of using plant materials as feedstocks for many products and then bringing life into local communities, employment, etc., is something very, very interesting. But again, we need policy frameworks and we need methodologies. We need to account for what it means, in this case, for, for, for the climate. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I hope I've given you a few, uh, a few hints of what's in the book, but also what's, what's on our agenda. Bene, noi veramente grazie, credo sia stati. Thank you very much. Those were three very important uh, contributions that help us uh, to really uh, help us really with our daily work here, that the more and more holistic approach, uh, even in the scientific context, to work in an integrated manner, understand how social sciences uh, are interlinked with classic uh, sciences. I mean, we will be dealing with these issues. We already are. Circular economy, the new directives. Uh, we realize that there are so many contradictions even within the European package. And all these will have to be managed somehow. We are a country that is doing a lot when it comes to recycling, but we're always in an emergency situation because we can't manage the waste cycle properly yet. We, we have the CO2 emissions issues. We're always trying together even thanks to discussions with Enrico Giovannini too, to come up, uh, come out every four months with uh, a figure on CO2 as well as the GDP figure, because uh, one is very understandable, but the CO2 figures may be a little less understandable. But we've seen that things are moving even in Italy in this field. There's a slight decoupling. The last figure tells us that a 1.5 increase in GDP has gone uh, hand in hand with a slight reduction in CO2 emissions. Of course, we should be doing more, but at least that's uh, a sign. But we don't have the same for dematerializing, though. On that, even though we increase the recycling, the recovery, we, uh, and an increase in GDP, we still have an increase in the production of waste. So that's an even more complex issue. And of course, this uh, is due to the choice of using uh, fossil uh, fuels and uh, the use of uh, coal in the past, but also an explosion of renewables in this country. It's still a bit uh, confused, though, when our legislative uh, uh, context doesn't help here. There's the photovoltaic. Uh, there's a very heated discussion on this in Italy. There, there are some weak signs, positive signs, but uh, there's still a lot to be done here. Okay, thank you to our colleagues. 
I don't know how long you can stay with us, but uh, we now go on to a second part that has to do with our work. If you would like to stay, you are more than welcome, of course. Uh, uh, I know you have other commitments. Uh, you have to inaugurate uh, a plant, or some of you have to. So you are free, of course, <laughs> to deal with your time. But we thank you for having come, for having participated. We felt it was a very important step this passage, this, because as well as the daily technical work that is hard work, as the minister was saying, confrontation or speaking with the business world is absolutely essential. We are trying to build a system of authorizations that will be a lot more homogeneous so that when the con environmental control conditions are the same all over, because otherwise you're creating a disequilibrium even in the economic growth and development. And this goes, of course, uh, this should be done at the European level too, because on the one hand we have to, of course, develop, well, we're talking about circular economy and the uh, top level technologies, but we also have to deal with pathological situations. We still have lots of situations where the management of, the, of waste is uh, still, well, not in line with circular economy, let's say. May I, may, I, may I just say two words more? Yeah. I think we should not talk so much about waste. We should talk about residue materials. Okay. And we should design products so that we have as little waste as possible. That is the first point. Secondly, and I, th I, 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 I should have elaborated maybe half a minute on that, I, I try to tell my government there is very little use in traveling to Brussels and agreeing to enhance recycling rates for different materials. If the materials are not designed so that you can make clever use of what you collect. And, and that, that, is, that is one of the problems. And that is linked to design. It's linked to taxes. Because as long as virgin materials are more cheap than, than secondary materials, it's very difficult to, to get the market for, for these materials. That's a ping pong idea. Yeah, that's the ping pong idea. Finally, since you talked about solar panels, we had a, we had a discussion this morning in another meeting with Jeremy Leggett, who is, is one of the world leading solar uh, uh, um, champions. He's got a company and he's also doing a lot of work in, 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 uh, in Africa. And I asked him, Jeremy, you are really deep into this. How large a percentage of what you produce and put on, on the homes of people is designed so that you one day can reuse the materials? And he looked at me and he said, you got a point there. And I happen to know it's the same with wind. And you know, the, the material is going into these installations are growing as we speak, massive. And even if, even if the, the end use time is 20 years from now. We have to prepare for it. So it's not, it's not becoming waste. So that, that could be an interesting thing for us to, to, move, to move forward in the European Union context. Yes, please. Uh, I think it's fabulous that you are already trying to publish in parallel with the GDP you know, the CO2 emissions uh, in the last quarter. I think it would be very much more, first of all, statistically simpler and very much more educational if you started publishing how many tons of oil equivalent of coal, oil and gas was used during the last quarter. Because getting those three numbers is statistically much simpler than trying to estimate the CO2, 
and you could, do, by using import statistics and production statistics, you could very quickly come up with a number, and it would fo it and it would focus the attention of the public on what is the real issue, namely the use of coal, oil, and gas. Certo, suggerimento assolutamente utile. Excellent suggestion. I talked more about CO2, but of course a publication, you know, gives a much more complex description of the complex situation. And obviously, fossil fuel use is essential. Our reports are quite complete, actually, but this. The relationship with citizens is something we have to deal with. How should we communicate figures that seem to be for experts? How can we present these to our citizens, find the right language to do so, so as to get the message across to our citizens? We are a public body. It is our duty to control the environment, but also to give the information to our citizens so that uh, they can live in a healthy and clean environment uh, that is uh, uh, suitable for human beings. So we have to find the right way of communicating and involving, committing uh, our citizens. And that's a big challenge. Prego. I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, the work that stems from putting together all these uh, this these data uh, referring to GDP goes way back. We've been trying to come up uh, with the best, and uh, when we did the work of our best uh, well-being, that is, we started off with uh, certain elements, and then we tried to cross all this, uh, and we had a hundred and. 56 indicators, and then we had to take at least some of these and turn them into the most, well, and take the most emblematic ones, and they turned into a law, 12 indicators, that is, that help or try to help us uh, reason on different indicators other than simple economic growth uh, by taking into account uh, the well-being element, which has a social element, a subjective element, too. There are some fundamental ones, like health, access to clean environment, etc., and emissions, CO2 emissions, are one of the 12 indicators. Four of these were chosen, actually. So the challenge we have before us and what lies behind everything we've said and is essential for all those collating data is that when you collate figures and statistical figures that can be used for something, they, it is so that we can shift towards a change so that, therefore, we're working on something that ha from scientific has to turn into political. It's not just theory. We want this to turn into practice. So I hope, at least, that you will help us on this, that the creation or the collation of data actually do contribute to including in economic planning elements and indicators that are essential for us living in a healthy planet. This is the real problem. 
if we can all work together on this, we will succeed. And uh, well, we're still here. I call upon well to tell us what we're doing in certain sectors. I call upon my colleague Giovanni Agnesod, who will speak to us a little about research and relations between it our world and the research world. I would ask the two speakers to stick to 15 minutes at speaking time so that we have time for questions. Well, my name is Giovanni Agnieszko, and I'm head of the Regional uh, Environmental Protection Agency of the Val d'Aosta, the Aosta Valley. This is linked to my long experience as director of the agency. I've been director of this agency for nine years now, and it's also linked to the role that has been entrusted to me as coordinator of uh, the dedicated research working group. Let's come to the take the challenge here, the real challenge we have as a national system for environmental protection, and its link with research. This SNPA was set up by this law of 2016. We must remember that ISPRA and the agencies already existed before, well before it was second half of the 90s that they were set up. That's more than 20 years ago. ISPRA wasn't called ISPRA at the time. It was called ANPA. And therefore, we have in this system the interaction, a synergy of bodies that actually have a history. And as for relations with the research institutes, we must stress that relations with research activities are not the same for all these bodies. There is uh, the contractual element, the direct element. ISPRA is a public research body, and ISPRA uh, staff has a public contract, whereas the agencies are not research agencies, and the contract uh, the prevailing contract uh, for ARPA uh, staff uh, is uh, the uh, health sector contract. And this may seem banal, but it's not. It has a lot of important consequences that we have to deal with every day. The health contract was not uh, drafted with the idea of agency type staff at all. And then there are operational differences. The operational context is different. Agency staff and their relations with the regions, the regional government, these relations are not easy. Often, agencies that are bodies that have technical management, administrative, and accounting autonomy. That's quite a lot. 
But often in their relations with the regions, we come up against behaviors and reactions that uh, are sort of uh, do this, uh, tell me this. Uh, I mean, they, the regions tend to treat us uh, as if uh, we were there at their service. Uh, so obviously this, but obviously this is not the necessary context for research, uh, for the sake of research. Now I'm not saying it's always like this, because as I said before, we've been working for over 20 years, so some progress has been made, but our relations with the regional governments is not all that smooth. And actually, it's quite different from region to region. And there are effects on the work of the operators, too. It's one thing if if you feel that you're a researcher, a scientist. It's another to feel that you are a person that has to carry out a given duty. And here again, and I'm using very gen generic terms here, the profiles and the visions in our agencies may be very different, but you have to bear this all in mind. What is fundamental to always remember is that the dimension of development, of operations, of uh, being open to innovation is absolutely a major part of activities that have to do with the environment. And this must be so. We have impacts uh, that require uh, ever-evolving studies and research. Uh, and uh, the survey techniques uh, uh, are becoming more and more accurate and mean that uh, we have pressures and impacts uh, identified that were not identifiable before. The quality of air in the Valle d'Aosta. Well, we used to talk only about suspended matter particles, but now when we talk uh, about uh, air pollution, we talk about micro pollutants. I mean, this is ever evolving. Uh, even the measuring techniques are evolving. And uh, there's a question of knowledge, the relationship between know-how and action to be undertaken. We are working within a context of action, acting upon the context we live in. In uh, there's the spatial and the tem time scale, space and time. Our activities, uh, even of dedicated research, targeted research, must have very clear uh, prospect uh, and very clear effect they may they will have on the circumstance on the conditions uh, the, of our that we live in. We have to move more towards being able to talk, able to communicate, able to understand each other, meaning us and our citizens. The complexity. And I was very happy to hear Gianfranco Bologna talk about this. Obviously, when you deal with environment, you're dealing with complexity. Research in the environmental sector is research that deals with the dynamics of complexity all the time. There is a sort of a retrograde uh, uh, way of thinking, obsolete way of thinking, 
whereby research has a, a frontier dimension that is set, but that's not so. Our, we are dealing with ever-changing complexity and ever-changing boundaries, therefore. The fundamental law, the law that set up this system, uh, law number 132 of 28th June 2016, it uh, takes on board this element. And in Article 3, it says, tar, uh, research activity aimed at, etc., etc. And then Article 3, Paragraph 2, uh, for the aims of uh, what you find in Article 1, etc., ISPRA and the agencies participate and carry out research activity, scientific and technical testing. Now, this uh, text, ex explicit text here, was something we were very happy to see, we in the agencies, because as I was saying before, we were active and had have been for decades, for more than 20 years, but and we've always done this uh, dedicated research. It's uh, inherent in our mission. It's what we should be doing. Like ex uh, ex the CO2 exchange, the CO2. Uh, cycle and how it works. You have it here. The relationship between this and the end use and biodiversity and the ecosystem services in general. This is something we've uh, been uh, working on for a long time already. And all this leads, has led to publications, scientific publications, that we do not see as an end, though. These are scientific publications that are absolutely essential to have a discussion on these issues. Now, in this system, how can we introduce uh, this system of dedicated, uh, targeted research? Well, we have this, what we call tavolo istruttorio, this working group and therefore the definition of an operational plan and the preparation of uh, a procedure for national projects and supranational projects. Now these objectives of this uh, workshop are completely in line with another element, which is the three-year activity plan that has been adopted already. These are official documents. The triennial action plan program with the vision, uh, objectives of sustainable development, protection of the environment, promotion of quality of the environment, uh, promoting uh, and being a reference, an authoritative and reliable reference point. In the try, try in the three-year program, uh, there is talk again of uh, dedicated research to find effective uh, solutions and answers and talks again of an operational plan, innovation and research plan, and then the European program uh, for the observation of the Earth called Copernicus. Here, 
we have operational innovation and research plan means looking forward, means work in progress. It means based on what you're doing, but proposing things for the future. The European Copernicus program is an activity that is very much work in progress. So you have activities that are already ongoing with future ones. The Copernicus program, I must say, well, I must quote to the workshop just 24 hours ago. Yesterday afternoon it was on environmental monitoring and environmental control. And this was described yesterday. And a very important stress was placed on the prospect of service for at the serve to being at the service of the community. All these monitoring tools, etc., should be seen from this point of view. Another important aspect uh, is the. Uh, conditions and scientific validation uh, protocols or MOUs with other research uh, institutes, uh, promoting the publication of products with high scientific content. This uh, dedicated research workshop that I am the coordinator of with other colleagues, the uh, working plan of this uh, is split into groups, separate uh, groups, uh, and they're listed here. Number one, deals with innovation and research. And we'll have a look at some of these, not all of them. Number one, operational plan for innovation and research. Now, what are they supposed to do? Uh, make a list of uh, research activities and emerging uh, needs define the criteria and the procedures to validate the products developed in this context and disseminate and spread a culture of innovation and research and stimulate these activities. I must hear make a comment. Though. There is a perception here that within the context of these various working committees and groups, that amongst these, the dedicated research one is perceived as marginal. But this is not so because as we know, and as I've already put in writing, dedicated research is fundamentally a fundamental part of the system. The Operational Innovation and Research Plan will be part of the three-year program of activities, and it must be in line with the national research program to and it must uh, foster relations and the creation of networks with other in public institutes. Two, three more minutes. Number two working group to uh, systematize instruments uh, for uh, projects and the promotion of participation in national, European, and international projects. We have a lot of experience here, getting in touch and collaborating with other bodies is uh, 
important also from the financial point of view because international projects allow you to find funds that are then allow you to further other activities. Here there's a small problem that is small but not banal. How can we define participation systems that we can call inherent in our national system? Because what the law has created is an institution, but not a public body as such. And these are the other working groups, invasive species, uh, charter of nature, citizen science, uh, exposure to polluting agents. Uh, now, citizen science, making people, individuals, and collectivities protagonists of issues that concern everybody. We must take back to people what belongs to people because it's part of their daily life, of their existence here on the planet Earth. Citizen science is another aspect that uh, is being concentrated on, and there's an event here. This was a week ago in Palmanova, Progetto Radon. It was a week ago, and uh, the general director of ISPRA spoke about the objectives and the advantages of citizen science. This shows that promoting participation, active participation of citizens is essential. This has to be seen very carefully though, because on the one hand you have participation, on the other hand you have the possibility of collating information, but all these, this information then has to be processed and has to be taken into account because a figure is not an end as such. There is a di another, a further dimension that is necessary to turn it into something practical. Correct use of results, feedback to the citizens, creation of networks, integration with official monitoring, the uh, uh, environment health uh, relations. What is fundamental is our relationship with the health world bearing in mind at least one thing properly, indicators of exposure are, are ours to extend when you're talking about the environment and this came up today too one sometimes wonders, well, are we really interested in the environment? Is there sufficient interest in the environment on the part of uh, the population? And I come back to uh, uh, what von Faisaka said, we need a new enlightenment, otherwise, this is not going to change, and I leave the floor to my colleague. Grazie Giovanni che ha avuto anche il compito di stringere un lavoro non, non da poco, e tra l'altro un lavoro di una certa... Uh, sì. di una... Thank you, and thank you for your very interesting presentation. minuti proprio per riuscire poi a chiudere, anzi se chiudiamo qualche minuto prima 
Thank you. And uh, I would like to ask the speaker to uh, respect his 15 minutes time. Um, I will now give the floor to Paolo Stranieri Arpa Umbria. Arpa Umbra, uh, Arpa Umbra uh, is uh, the region uh, which uh, basically has uh, is doing the research part of our uh, activity. We uh, we uh, have uh, therefore carried out a very interesting activity with regards to the research area in this sector. Good morning. Uh, first of all, uh, let me um, send the best regards of uh, my director, Ganapini, who couldn't make it here today. And uh, I'm sure he would have loved it uh, because all of these issues uh, were extremely interesting, very thought provoking, uh, and I'm sure he would have loved being part of it. Uh, I was uh, having this meeting yesterday with the Director General. I won't go through most of the things which have already been addressed uh, because uh, uh, I don't want to repeat uh, things that which have already been illustrated. Uh, there's a number of challenges uh, that uh, have to be addressed and that have been mentioned today. There's a constant interconnection between agency uh, and research uh, and the citizens at large. Um, in our everyday life, uh, there's a number of uh, uh, initiatives which have to do with uh, data pr processing. And um, uh, this uh, research is very important. Uh, so just by way of example, we have companies which uh, have to uh, submit their uh, projects uh, and uh, or the citizens, the citizens uh, who Uh, are asking for further uh, information uh, with uh, regards to the environment uh, to uh, protect their own safety and their own health. Uh, we were uh, making examples of uh, scenarios of 10 and 20 years ago, uh, but uh, just uh, uh, think about uh, the impact uh, that uh, smells have uh, uh, on the environment. Uh, and uh, this is a kind of a no man's land, uh, because uh, we um, have no points of residence. Uh, so it's like kind of uncharted waters. Uh, uh, and we have to set up new parameters and reference points when it comes to assessing this sector. I would like to uh, talk about some of the initiatives that have been taken by our agency, uh, by our region, uh, the contribution that we are giving uh, to uh, the 4.0 uh, dialogue uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, because Most of these uh, uh, initiatives, unless they uh, really involve uh, all citizens and they have a bottom-up approach, uh, uh, they kind of become useless. They're not really delivering on their goals. Uh, so I would like to uh, say one thing with regards to our region. Uh, we are trying to develop a new dialogue uh, with uh, region stakeholders uh, uh, in the field of environmental impact, uh, of new plans and strat strategies uh, for a sustainable development of our territory. We want to further enhance dialogue uh, with uh, all stakeholders, so all uh, with citizens, uh, with urban designers, uh, and we want to uh, um, address uh, the requirements uh, of our citizens. Uh, hence, uh, the important role also played by ARPA, uh, ARPA and uh, to further develop dialogue uh, with the uh, industry and the business environment. Uh, 
we also have to carefully uh, analyze the uh, reaction uh, of the business environment uh, when it comes to new plans uh, on uh, sustainable development and other initiatives. Uh, just by way of example, we are um, carrying out a, num a number of small-scale uh, projects uh, in our uh, region, uh, such as, for instance, a new project with the uh, steel uh, environment. Uh, and we are uh, testing out a new sensors, uh, uh, low-cost sensors, uh, which uh, could uh, also allow us to set up a new dialogue with citizens. Uh, we are presently uh, testing out uh, personal uh, devices and equipment uh, to assess uh, the uh, impact that this equipment has on the citizens for their health. So to assess uh, the uh, impact on the environment and how this uh, ties in with the uh, health of citizens. Uh, these are just a few instances uh, of what we do with the data. We uh, try to uh, develop uh, a wealth of uh, data, of information through our monitoring activity. We really talk about millions and millions of uh, uh, data. So uh, our agency has a uh, huge amount of uh, data. If uh, we were uh, just to consider uh, the data referring to water, we have 3.5 million uh, data just for water-related information, just to give you a sense of uh, the volume of data that we have. So to conclude, I think that if we are to take up uh, the, our challenges, uh, we have to focus on quality. And uh, quality, even on a small scale, even on a day-by-day -day life. Uh, I started uh, working in the sector three years ago. Uh, this uh, department uh, was already well organized, uh, but uh, for instance, 20 or 20 per, uh, 30 percent of such data uh, do not have a georeferential system, which is indeed extremely important. So we have to train our people, and they have to become aware that uh, this new parameter uh, has to be connected to a georeferential system, because otherwise uh, uh, the risk is uh, to have data that uh, are going to be useless, because I'm not sure where do they come from. So uh, a GPS system is of the essence. Um, I would like to conclude uh, my presentation. I promise I will be very brief. I will only uh, take five minutes of your time. So uh, we uh, follow the decision-making uh, process uh, uh, in uh, on the way we manage our data. Uh, our agency is part of a uh, larger scale uh, project uh, which has been developed together with the Ministry uh, for the Environment and a number of uh, stakeholders. Uh, because as uh, Paolo was saying, uh, uh, all systems have to be interconnected uh, within the framework of a bottom-up approach. Uh, uh, and this is very important for any project uh, that we want to carry out. So uh, we uh, assess uh, environmental uh, impact and uh, uh, the impact on the system at large. So we've developed uh, a new uh, data learning system. Uh, statistics, as uh, we said this morning, is very important when it comes to environmental impact. But the real innovation here is 
is uh, that uh, uh, we usually say that we, we lack is uh, data, whereas uh, today this is not no longer the uh, issue. Today, actually, we're overwhelmed by uh, data. Probably uh, we even have too much data. So what we need to do today is to have new assessment tools. Uh, uh, new assessment tools uh, uh, that uh, uh, are used by the five major uh, companies uh, when uh, they carry out their analysis. So, l'approccio già diciamo di collaborazione chiedendo ai cittadini di partecipare. Well, uh, well, one of the assessments uh, that we carry out uh, is uh, in the field of smells. Uh, we need to develop uh, new projects, uh, 2.0 projects. Uh, uh, citizens uh, uh, want to know how we uh, will be implementing uh, this uh, project, uh, and uh, they want uh, uh, this uh, project to be a user-friendly project that they can maybe have uh, through an app. Uh, so therefore, uh, tools uh, are extremely important uh, when it comes to implementing uh, these projects. Uh, uh, this is a 12-year-long uh, project uh, that uh, we've carried out with many other countries. Uh, so we have redefined this uh, project. Uh, and we're not talking about models, uh, but uh, basically we're talking about uh, uh, systems uh, that can allow us to manage uh, the project. So the citizen uh, is fully involved with these processes. Uh, this is a sharing uh, uh, model uh, for the uh, mitigation and uh, where uh, this sector, the specific sector of smell has uh, uh, registered a very severe impact on the environment. Uh, citizens were very happy with the uh, results. Uh, citizens were very happy because uh, they could really uh, be involved uh, in this project. They were fully aware that the company was doing something about it. And this is just one example. Uh, this is the one of the major advantages of the platform. Um, and then uh, the impact of the on the environment. Uh, so uh, the uh, environmental impact uh, is extremely important. Uh, so uh, environmental impact uh, and cumulative environmental impact are very important. Uh, data banks, uh, database uh, uh, has to uh, further develop all this information. Uh, and. Um, uh, what we need, we need uh, uh, new uh, management tools uh, that, that can uh, use uh, these, uh, these uh, data. And uh, uh, this uh, has to be tied in with the uh, global uh, uh, accounting system. And uh, these new technologies uh, uh, are uh, very interesting because they gave a lot of new opportunities for all stakeholders. Uh, all stakeholders are fully involved in the process uh, up front. Uh, I, as I said, I promised I would don't no long, we'll be talking just for five minutes. Uh, this is the slide just uh, to give you a very um, global overview of what we're doing in uh, with our project, uh, we will have guidelines 4.0 that uh, will be uh, illustrated in uh, 2020. And uh, uh, we hope we will have an opportunity to uh, share the findings of our uh, project uh, with the scientific environment. Uh, and thank you for your kind attention. Grazie, grazie all'ingegner Magro, visto l'orario, insomma, io credo se non c'è qualche intervento specifico. Okay. Is there any specific question? Well, I don't know. We've had a very, very, a very, very full morning. Once again, I would like to thank Gianfranco Bologna and the Club of Rome and all those who've, uh, I think, given us some broader vision of uh, this. Uh, 
beyond that goes beyond our daily work. I think one of the main points of the Pope's encyclical is that, on the one hand, we have these incredible visions, but then we also have these specific uh, issues. So uh, it was really an incredible effort on his part. We have highly appreciated this because it's helped us understand the usefulness of the work we're doing because all too often we you get a bit too stuck in your own work and you lose the more general view that you should have too. We can, of course, make a contribution, but we are a major public institution, truly European. We see that from all the projects that are appearing, the ones concerning the space, Gianfranco mentioned the history, the first satellite, and now there's, well, there are lots of satellites uh, spinning around above our heads, but this has allowed us uh, to study and know uh, what the situation of our territory is almost in real time. So the whole approach has changed. So we are one of the most important or largest communities of users. We are a system that includes 10,000 people specifically working on these issues. And I think it's our duty to try to explain what system we are working in. And we really felt that it was necessary along this path of governance that is extremely difficult towards explaining what we are doing. Of course, there's the municipalities, the provinces, the regions, the governments, and it's not easy to deal with all these dimensions. But we chose this path because we think that to uh, so that we can hold our convention in 2019, it was necessary. We didn't want it to just be a celebration, to just be words. We wanted to activate uh, a, a new cultural approach because uh, this is uh, what we have to base ourselves on to create new paradigms. And we've seen in this discussion that we're going to continue elsewhere, we've seen how in this country there are incredible realities when it comes to innovation. We were mentioning aluminium before. There are companies that make blisters for medicines. They make incredible products for uh, and these exist uh, over and above the creation of circular economy. There are companies that have banked everything on these this kind of thing. So there are positive examples, very many. So an interactive discussion with the business world that allows us to contribute, well, to construct or build up a set of rules is absolutely essential. And we've done a bit of testing outside our specific rules. 
uh, informally with our business, uh, with the business world, to understand how we can do things better and try to understand better what all this means for businesses. I think today's meeting was important also to place our activities in the more broader context of the scientific world because otherwise we end up doing each one his or her job and forgetting what part our work plays in the more general, the broader system or world. And the third major question that was brought up uh, yesterday you talked about this uh, generically the governance of processes that is is the link with as we've said the scientific world how can we be less authoritative uh, less authoritarian and more authoritative. Here again, however, we do have a role. We are the public element, the public body that citizens must trust because the message is we are doing things properly in your interest, for your health. The relationship between citizens and public bodies is not this at the moment. We have to reconquer the trust of our citizens. It is not going to be so easy. There's no easy solution to this, but we have to do it. That small example that was given of the Umbria region was a very important uh, example. It, does the citizen trust us? Is the citizen convinced of what we're saying? These are small elements that are fundamental. And that example was uh, is proof of the trust of citizens in their public bodies. In Italy, this is a problem, but not only in Italy either. It, uh, it exists elsewhere too. So citizen science is something we would like to deal with and work on not as we do, well, we have uh, the pollution of uh, birds. We have a data bank on that, thanks to the contribution, the active participation of the citizens. And this, uh, to see how climate change has an impact on uh, the change in uh, uh, flying uh, routes of uh, birds. But so the invol involving citizens in daily monitoring even, get them to do, to, to do this, to participate actively in all this. They must feel involved, engaged. This is not banal at all. It's what we should be doing as public bodies. So these were just some comments I wanted to make to explain also what we had in mind when we uh, developed uh, this event and then the convention and after the convention that will not be the end we hope it will be the beginning of a new phase as Gianfranco was saying we will always back all this work actively and very strongly to help achieving the objectives that were set even, well, 50 years ago, in fact, some of them. And that paradoxically, since the forecast, or reality is worse than the forecast, but 
we now have a degree of knowledge and know-how that allows us to make better choices for the future. So thank you all very much.